Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's Snack and Learn webinar. Uh, I will just mention the housekeeping items before I, I hand it over to Soren to present. Uh, the presentation slides are available to download in the handout box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And also you can find there uh, a question box where you can log your questions for the Q&A session that will be at the end of the presentation. So I would hand it over to Soren to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for joining. I'm Søren Gabriel, and uh, I'll take you through today's webinar. And I'll tell you about how we are working with reducing carbon footprint in our climate adaptation project in uh, WSP Denmark. My background is uh, I'm an engineer in chemistry, and I've been working as a consultant for more than 25 years. Uh, I have a function of head of R&D in climate and sustainability, and I'm in our department of climate adaptation and urban development. Just to give a brief presentation uh, about our department, uh, I can tell we are some 40 people. We used to be engineers, all of us, but it has changed since we started 10 years ago working with climate adaptation. So we've got a, a lot of hydraulic modelers and we've got almost 20 landscape architects. The project you're seeing here is a project we just finished uh, in May this year, Kant's Mine, it's called. It's a cloudburst handling project, uh, and at the same time, we handle a lot of everyday rain. Um, I'm bragging a bit because last week we won uh, the Danish utility sector's uh, annual climate adaptation prize for this project. Uh, here we are looking at, at uh, the uh, inlet of, of uh, the project, and uh, in case of a cloudburst, we have about five cubic meters per second being pumped into the project here. Uh, and uh, uh, we are receiving about 15,000 cubic meters of water uh, in total. Going through the project, uh, there's uh, this uh, uh, paved area uh, as, uh, as a new lane all, all the way through the project, about 600 meters. And then we use it as a combination as, as like a, a lane for the pedestrian and uh, as transportation for, for water in case of, of uh, cloud burst. It's uh, paved with uh, ceramic tiles, and uh, it's uh, an important part of, of, of the design. You can see here we, we go through this uh, canal, and then we enter a cleaning zone, and then we are dump in a reservoir, which uh, will flood with up to 15,000 cubic meters of water. We've developed a new uh, uh, um, cleaning facility. We call it a trickle meadow. Uh, which combines sedimentation with, with cleaning with plants, and then it ends up in the lake. And it's all been made uh, in, in, uh, in a, a socially deprived area, and uh, a focus, a major focus in the project has been to, to improve the conditions for the people living in the area. And uh, I'm really proud of it. I've visited, uh, visited a lot of times, and every time I come there, I hear from the people living there that, that they love the project. So if you ever come to Copenhagen, don't hesitate to, to go and have a look at it. But to the agenda, uh, I'll go, for, go through the reduction goals uh, for, for carbon footprint print in uh, our projects. We have uh, in WSP Denmark uh, our own reduction goals. And then I'll take you briefly through how we calculate the carbon footprint and then tell about a project we're doing together with a client uh, where we made, we've made like an inspirational catalog uh, for how to reduce carbon footprint in, in stormwater projects. And then uh, I'll show you how we optimize our projects with what we call the carbon wheel, an invention we made here in WSP Denmark, and then through some con concluding remarks. But uh, to the goals, uh, we decided back in uh, 2021 to reduce our uh, carbon footprint in our uh, design and advice in 2030. Uh, by 50%, and that is extremely ambitious. And, and to to uh, to see if we succeeded, of course, we had to make a, a baseline. So already last year, we made a calculation of of 10% uh, of our projects, and then we are doing more this year, and next year, just to have a baseline to see if we are actually succeeding to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. <clears throat> We are helped uh, in our building sector. Uh, we are helped because the Danish building regulations, and I'm sorry this is in Danish, but it's not available in, in English. Um, there have been in the building regulations some changes that means that already this year, 1st of January, there was a limit of 12 kilograms CO2 per square meter per year in construction and operation of, of new buildings. And that's uh, per year 
So for those of you living in UK, you might uh, per year or 50 years, uh, you'd rather do it as a, a, uh, as a total emission uh, over 50 years. So this is similar to 600 kilograms uh, CO2 per square meter over 50 years. And then we're going to reduce uh, every second year up to 2029, 20, and of course further on. And mandatorily, we have to cut about 40% of, of the carbon footprint. And uh, then there's uh, a voluntary uh, class as well, where we cut 60% of, of the carbon footprint in, in uh, the buildings. So that's very close to our 50% uh, goal. But that's in the building sector. I'm working in the utility sector with stormwater. And uh, again, this is in Danish. It's a, a figure from uh, um, one of our clients, Nuvafos, a utility company covering nine municipalities. And uh, it's splitting up into scope one, which covers direct emissions from combustion engines and uh, from, uh, for instance, uh, wastewater treatment plants where we've got nitrous oxide, methane, and other climate gases uh, being emitted. Then they have what they call scope two, which is emissions from uh, the energy we are buying. And then we have scope three, which we've decided to reduce by 50% in 2030. And that covers construction and, and uh, uh, materials and et cetera, bought by, by uh, the utility company. And uh, this utility company, Novafos, they made back in, in uh, they made it last year uh, for, for the 2021, they made a, a calculation of their total carbon footprint. And it's very similar to for what you see in, in the building sector, that the scope three, the constructions, uh, uh, is the major part. So they've been focusing, uh, and we as a sector have been focusing on scope one, direct emissions to reduce the emissions from wastewater treatment, uh, on scope two to save energy, but uh, actually it, sh it has shown out, and it was a surprise for the entire sector when these calculations were made, that uh, the, the major impact comes from, uh, from the construction. This gives a total uh, emission of about 100,000 tons a year from uh, this utility company, and as I said, it's covering nine municipalities. <clears throat> we have a challenge in reducing scope three. Uh, first thing is, as I said, define a baseline from where we are, we are reducing, and we already started that. Uh, the other thing is that the projects we're doing, they're, they're not our projects, they're our clients' projects. So we have to convince our clients uh, to reduce uh, um, the emissions in, in their projects. And of course, then we have to help them. My experience is that uh, there's a lot of interest in this, uh, but uh, I might come back to that later on. And then uh, a third challenge is, of course, when we're going to do this, we have to, to find out how, how do we reach the goal. So we have to find a method uh, to uh, how to reduce the carbon footprint in all project phases. And then we have to have a knowledge about uh, uh, what's, what's the actual footprint of different stormwater handling methods. And uh, we've been working on, on that together with Norfos and other uh, utility companies, and I'll take you briefly through that. But before I do that, uh, we're calculating carbon footprint uh, uh, with an LCA, that's a life cycle assessment. That's a kind of cradle to grave uh, calculation on, on uh, all environmental param parameters uh, covering uh, environmental impacts and, and resources. And uh, we're using a, a Danish freeware tool uh, provided by the government called Intra Infra LCA infra LCA, but there's a lot of other uh, uh, different uh, tools for this purpose, but, but uh, the, our clients tend to ask us to, uh, to use this tool. And when you do this life cycle assessment, you can do it on products, you can do it on, on, on uh, different solutions, you can put solutions together and make systems, you can calculate on products, on projects or plans or even strategies. And you, you can do it with different uh, deta uh, level of detail. Uh, it's completely as calculating price. Uh, of course, in, in an early phase, you have to have some rough calculations. And uh, in a more final phase, you have to make more precise calculations. When you've done the calculation, you can use it to optimize a product or a solution or a plan. Uh, or you can use, uh, use it for comparing different solutions and to see which one is better. And I just want to, to make sure that, that uh, you, you understand, uh, I talk today about the, the carbon thing, uh, the, the, the climate gas uh, emissions, but uh, we don't have this carbon tunnel emission. We, we have focus on other resources and, and uh, environmental impacts and other 
um, uh, parameters within sustainability. And I'd say having 20 landscape architects, as our colleagues, there's a lot of focus on everything else but carbon. What we've been making together with this utility company, Novafos, is an inspirational catalog. You can see the front page here uh, uh, on working with uh, stormwater management. And it covers a methodology of, of how we work with reducing carbon footprint in the projects. And we've been introducing this to the project leaders within this organization over three workshops. And uh, we've had about 50 project leaders through this. And tomorrow I have a meeting with all the municipalities owning this utility company and other 60 people being introduced to how we're working with it. So uh, that's part of convincing our clients uh, uh, that they should uh, focus on, on, on carbon footprint. And apart from the, the, the method, we have uh, made calculations on about uh, 20, 25 different solutions for transporting water, for detaining water, uh, and for infiltrating water, and then for soil handling. So you can see, say this is a, 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 a sample of a fact sheet that can help you get an overview of uh, what's the carbon footprint of, of uh, different solutions. The methodology for this purpose, uh, inspired by the building sector, we made this carbon circle, we call it. And the idea about the carbon circle is that uh, there are different phases of a project from strategy to planning over design to construction and operation. And as I said earlier, we've been focusing on the operation phase for years. And if you go to any good engineer, traditional engineer, and tell him we're working uh, to, f to find uh, low carbon solutions, he would go directly into build low carbon and look for, could we use electric machines? Could we have low carbon materials, etc. And that's important, but it has shown out that, that uh, the major savings, they're actually in the strategy uh, plan and, and design phase, where the strategy phase is focusing on, uh, on uh, reducing carbon emissions, uh, as a goal similar to the other goals we're working with and to build less and postpone our projects. Building for the future, we've turned upside down. So building for the future is not to build for 100 years events that we used two years ago, but it's actually it's building what's necessary today and then uh, um, expanding the capacity if, if necessary. Building collaboratively is uh, including uh, the municipality and, and local citizens in our solutions and building wisely is of course uh, the design. I'll take you through a, a, a few examples of how we're working with this. Use of electric machines, uh, that's where uh, some of my uh, engineering colleagues uh, of course they would focus and, and uh, there's a potential in it uh, where we could see just changing from, from uh, traditional uh, diesel-driven machines to electric machinery. We can, with the Danish electricity, reduce the carbon footprint from this construction phase with about 90%. And within 10 years from now, we will have another reduction of 75% of these last 10% because our electricity comes uh, more and more from uh, solar panels and uh, wind turbines. Uh, an important thing about this, it's ex still it's expensive to use these electric machines and, and it's not very common yet, but we're driving the de development of new technologies together with our clients uh, if, if we ask uh, the constructors to use electric machines. But it's still in the very beginning with these electric machines and, and uh, the heavy machines and the transportation on trucks and so on is not on electricity yet. Another thing, thing, we are doing a project on, on the reuse of soil in, in the construction projects and uh, the calculations uh, you can see on the circle here, it's about collaboration uh, with the project owner, typically the municipality. It's about designing and, and building uh, low carbon and, and, and doing it wisely. And uh, we have made a, a, a calculation on typically sewer project covering excavation in, in existing road, transportation of soil out of the, the, out of the system, fitting up with new gravel or recycled soil, and then putting on new asphalt. And uh, we have made this uh, comparison of, of uh, a traditional project where we use, take away the soil for, for deposit and use new gravel and compare it to a, a, system, a project where we reuse the soil. We have a local deposit just close to, to the project site and then we reuse the soil, uh, soil. And just by reusing the soil, we can actually reduce the carbon footprint by almost 50%. 
Uh, another thing, and it's hard to convince uh, colleagues and clients that we should do this, that, that's postponing projects uh, and extending the lifetime of existing construction. So instead of building today, rather build tomorrow or in 10 years from now. And um, there's several ways this has an impact. Uh, one important thing is that if we postpone it 10 years, the goals in the framework for the project might be different. So maybe we shouldn't even construct what we thought we were going to construct. Then I told about the construction machinery and electric transport, where we have huge savings, especially in 10 years from now. Future materials will have a lower carbon footprint. Even today, we can have uh, ceramic, uh, no, sorry, uh, concrete slabs with a 50% lower carbon impact than two years ago. Still, they're costly, but but in 10 years from now, it'll be standard products. Uh, and as I said earlier, carbon footprint of electricity will be reduced further. So our best guess in construction projects within our sector is that we could achieve uh, between 50 and 90 percent of uh, uh, reduction for, for carbon footprint. And in most of our projects, my guess would be rather 90 than 50 percent. So that's a great perspective. Then uh, about the fact sheets, we're covering more than 50, uh, 20 different solutions and, and each solution is described uh, over two pages like this. And a part of this is uh, uh, some, uh, together with some general uh, uh, actions to reduce uh, carbon footprints, uh, then we have some specific uh, uh, reduction potential for this solution. And then we've made some carbon calculations on, on this project. And I'll focus on, on this one. This is a wet detention pond. Uh, where we uh, made 17,500 cubic meters of, of detention volume, and it has total uh, uh, emission of 284 tons uh, uh, CO2. And we can see on, on, on this figure that excavation and, and disposal of soil, that's the heavy par parameter in this. Another heavy parameter is the membrane. So even uh, with just one figure, if you want to optimize it, this you can see that you should maybe focus on the excavation and uh, disposal of soil and, and rather build it in locally than try to transport it out of, 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 uh, the, of uh, the project area. And uh, that was a uh, wet detention point as an example. And uh, we have a, a total of eight different uh, detention solutions. You can see the, the uh, detention, wet detention point. We have a carbon footprint of 2 to 15 kilograms per cubic meter, where dry detention points, that's approximately the same. If we do go into green streets in existing city, we, uh, um, it becomes quite expensive because we have to cut up our asphalt and, and uh, 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 make uh, make new paving and, and curbs, et, et cetera. Uh, so they, those are quite expensive solutions, but but they have other qualities than than uh, than ponds. You can do uh, subsoil detention in uh, cassettes uh, with a membrane around them in concrete uh, or or plastic pipes, or you could do it uh, below uh, parking uh, places with with uh, permanent pavers and and uh, then uh, a detention reservoir below. And they're all quite expensive in in uh, in uh, carbon footprint as well. So if you can do it, uh, you should rather go with the cheaper solutions. So some of you might ask, what about this Kahn's Mini project I was bragging about? We made 15,000 cubic meters of, of detention volume. And uh, I had a student, a master student, uh, try to do a calculation on the carbon footprint of this project. And I should say it was designed three years ago before we had the focus on, on carbon footprint. And um, we ended up with a, a carbon footprint of 50 cubic, uh, kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of, of uh, of a reservoir, and you have to compare that to 5 to 15 for a normal wet detention pond. And the reason are these ceramic tiles. More than 75% of the carbon footprint of the entire project comes from these ceramic tiles. And we didn't have the focus at that time, but it's just an example of uh, if you don't focus from the very beginning, uh, just a simple solution of, of, uh, of which pavement you choose has an, a, a huge impact. If we had used, for instance, a concrete slab, slabs, we could have reduced the, the, the carbon footprint of the paving by 80%. So for my concluding remarks, um, we are going to meet reduction goals within the, the, the uh, stormwater handling sector or in any sector. 
uh, and uh, we're going to meet them, and, and our clients are going to meet them. So we have to um, to find out how to calculate on this and, and do it with different degrees of detail, because we shouldn't spend hours on finding precise data in the early project phases, because, I mean, uh, we just need an order of magnitude to, to find the good solutions and follow them. We have made this method of, uh, with the carbon wheel and it's really useful. We use it with a lot of clients in all our projects. And uh, I would say we experience great interest from our clients uh, because we have this uh, concrete approach and action-oriented approach to how to reduce carbon footprint. So one thing, one last thing to remember, uh, and I say it again and again for my colleagues and, and for our clients, calculations don't change our carbon footprint, actions do. Thank you. Uh, so, any questions? Thank you, Soren, uh, for a fantastic presentation, really impressive uh, project photos that you shared with us. So, thank you for that. I will mention quickly the housekeeping items. The presentation slides are available to download in the handout box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And please continue to log your questions in the question box. Again, this is on the control panel. I will start with the first question. You mentioned that you perform your LCA from cradle to grave. Are you also looking to, at cradle to cradle? No, we're not looking from cradle to cradle, and I would say not even cradle to grave. Um, it's it's always a discussion when when you do an LCA, how far should you go in the calculation, and um, the end of life of of our project. We does we don't uh, in, involve that in our um, uh, calculations. So there are different reasons for that. Pipes, uh, we would never dig them up. That's one perspective. Uh, another thing is that the reuse of the materials, we could include it in our calculations, but it's, it's today's carbon footprint that's important. So even that we even if we can reuse these uh, ceramic tiles, for instance, in 100 years from now, the alternative in, a, in 100 years uh, from now would be have a lot uh, lower carbon impact. So for that reason, it's, it's not fair to take it into consideration. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is the balance made between tracking carbon sequestration, for example, trees, and embodied carbon, for example, concrete bulkheads? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I actually made a calculation for this new force utility. Um, they have this uh, carbon uh, footprint of 100,000 uh, uh, tons a year. And if we sh you should make, an, make, a, make a carbon sequestration, for instance, by planting trees, uh, every second year you'd have to plan an area uh, at the same size as uh, the entire Copenhagen, which is the capital of, of, of uh, Denmark. So um, there's no way uh, out of reducing our carbon footprint. We can't do it with the sequestration by planting trees, definitely. Thank you. How big are the extra costs of reducing CO2 in construction project, and is it a barrier to reducing CO2 emissions in the construct construction phase? Um, we, uh, we, if you go to the building sector, we can see that it's, it's it still is more expensive to build low carbon. It'll, it'll change in the future, I'm sure. But uh, our experience is that within our sector, um, is carbon savings comes with economic savings. So that makes it easy to convince the clients to go that way as well. Thank you. Um, is it difficult to convince your clients that they should include CO2 reduction as a goal in their projects? Um, no, I wouldn't say it's difficult. I mean, it's not mandatory within our sector yet, but um, but my experience is that everybody wants to change something and, and they can see the importance of reducing the carbon footprint and when we are coming with a concrete method and say we can start from a and end up at b uh, and and they can see themselves in that product process i, I, I my experience is that they, they they want to take that journey with us so i still i still haven't had a client who said we don't want, want to do that Thank you. Uh, I hope I read this question correctly. In typical above ground suits featured, for example, basins, swells, etc., what is the most significant cause of lifetime carbon? Again, it's if above in the ground, surface, above yeah, ground. yeah, above ground, uh, that's uh, excavation and tr transportation. 
And I would say if you uh, if you could use electric machine for excavation and you can you, you could build in the soil locally, you would reduce the carbon footprint by more than 80 percent in, in in most of these cases. So that's where to focus. Thank you. The next question is about data. How do you obtain precise data for your calculation of CO2 footprint in projects? Yeah, precise. <laughs> That's always a question. But but uh, uh, all life cycle assessments are based on what's called EPD, uh, environmental product declarations, where uh, uh, the company is producing uh, gravel or plastic pipes or whatever. They are making these environmental product declarations for their products, and and um, and based on that, it's it's basically it's a price list on environmental impact and resources, uh, and and based on that we can do our calculations. Of course, we don't have all products, but then we go into the materials and the uh, the the, uh, the process for for pr producing the product, and and uh, thereby we can calculate like a rough estimate. But it's again, it's important not to focus too much on being precise because I mean, if it's precise within 80 or 90 90 percent, we can still uh, find the right solution and and uh, have this focus on action rather than details. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about construction machinery that you touched on before on some of the slides. What are the plans to reduce carbon footprint from construction machinery? Will it be electrification of equipment or use of non-fossil uh, sources? Uh, it will definitely be, be electrification. I don't know about the huge trucks, the discussion whether they should uh, run on hydrogen or, or, um, or electricity. Uh, biofuels uh, tend to have a higher carbon impact actually than diesel, so I, I think that's a dead end. But uh, what we see here is that local construction machinery, they're, they're going to run on e electricity. And that reduces the carbon footprint and at the same time, it reduces the, the, the uh, air pollution and the noise. And uh, we see uh, from the, the, the constructors that uh, we hear from the constructors that that the people living in the areas that, where they're using electric machines, they're very happy with it. We have it, actually have a company here that made for the municipality of Copenhagen two completely identical roads just next to each other, one with traditional machinery, machinery and another one with electric machinery. And then they made a survey uh, uh, between the people living there to ask uh, how they felt about the construction period. And it showed out that uh, electric machinery were pre preferred by people due to lower noise and, and, uh, and less pollution. So it's a win-win. But they're still expensive, and a lot of the machinery are rebuilt traditional machinery. But but within a few years from now, it'll it'll be standard. Thank you. I will take the last question. Um, is the end life impact of the materials and method taking into consideration when trying to reduce the carbon footprint? No. Again, uh, I, uh, I touched it briefly. Uh, not yet. Uh, it'll be the next, but but uh, uh, we we don't uh, include uh, end of life because end of life should be recycling and and uh, um, again uh, we cannot take that recycling into consideration now because because it's today's carbon footprint that'll be important. Thank you, thank you, Soren, for a fantastic presentation, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your time. Uh, all uh, additional questions, uh, please feel free to contact uh, Soren via the contact details shown on the screen. So we will wrap up thank the you. session now. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you very much.